Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. It's my honor and privilege to greet you here at our panel discussion. And within the framework of the forum, we are discussing the future of cities and towns, and we're going to discuss the professions of the future, uh, what exactly we are going to develop uh, and uh, what is going to vanish, and it is some kind of a complicated issue as we are in the midst of uh, the rapid uh, uh, revolutionary growth and uh, dramatically the situation is changing and uh, the labor markets are changing as well. And uh, uh, so the dramatic uh, changes uh, led uh, to the uh, new makeup uh, of uh, cities and towns, and some uh, just uh, uh, lost their identity, some acquired some new and uh, were revitalized. And so the question arises as to how we may undergo through transformations and uh, how we uh, could make Moscow an attractive city for talents, for skilled people, for new businesses, and uh, that Moscow may only uh, gain from the technological revolution and not otherwise. And we're going to discuss this issue with our experts from abroad and from Russia and how Moscow is going to change as well as the labor markets. Uh, Andrei Bishtenko, uh, the uh, deputy of the CEO uh, for Department of Labor and Social Protection of Moscow. Uh, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I would like uh, to say from the outset and highlight the situation at the labor market in uh, Moscow. And uh, the uh, metropolis always uh, has uh, a different uh, labor market. Uh, and uh, as we have a concentration of educational establishments and we have a situation of uh, specific situation with the uh, immigration with the adjacent regions uh, and the people are coming to Moscow as well and uh, 2.5 million are uh, those uh, coming from various uh, places, but in agglomeration it's over 20 million. And uh, uh, what about the uh, ratio between the economically active uh, population and the other type of population? It's about 7 million people, uh, but uh, the mo motto indicator of the International Labor Organization gives us a statistics of a very low statistics uh, in uh, uh, the employment. And uh, so there are not so many unemployed. Also, we have uh, trading activities, educational activities, manufacturing, processing, transport, logistics, uh, services. And these spheres attract quite a number of uh, uh, skilled people. And over the past uh, uh, several years, especially as of 2010, the labor market uh, in Moscow was revitalized. And uh, we see uh, quite a number of organizations uh, uh, which uh, declared that they will have uh, uh, just the reorganization uh, of their organ reorganization and uh, that uh, the companies uh, would like to retain people. They uh, value their personnel and there are not so many uh, dismissals uh, as of 2016. Uh, concerning other factors like the registered unemployment, here we witness a very positive trend and on the whole uh, we have the decline from 74 up to 29,000 when people recognized that they are not, uh, not uh, uh, working, that they are unemployed. And if we compare uh, 2016 and 2018, 2018 shows better positive dynamics. 
And uh, also the labor market was revitalized uh, via other uh, indicators. And what, the, what are those positive indicators? That is the uh, number of vacancies at the labor market, the number of announced vacancies provided by the employers of Moscow. And in 2016, it was 299,000 vacancies. In 2017, uh, we closed 398,000 vacancies. But over the past six months of 20. 18, we've already got 250,000 vacancies, and uh, sometimes uh, the dynamics of the first uh, six months uh, should not uh, a very dramatic one, but we anticipate that this year will be quite a productive in terms of vacancies. And all the component parts of the labor market are quite balanced. And Moscow is a large economic center, and it attracts all the component parts of the labor market, and that is supply and demand, and functionality, the professional training and retraining, and what needs to be done by the employer in the foreseeable future, what competences will be in demand as well as skills. Uh, and the question arises how the labor market is going to change vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, applications of the employers. As the employers uh, just uh, uh, do the ruling at the market. And let me just give you some uh, case, cases about the emergence of the new professions, for example. And uh, some uh, were trained at the uh, Skolko platform as a result of the collaboration with the Agency of Information. And we see quite a number of brand new professions. And uh, in the coming 20 years, uh, there will be a number of new professions which are of great interest to Moscow. And we would like to draw uh, the attention of the Department for Education as uh, to which challenges uh, they have to face. The tourism nowadays uh, has as the architecture of territories, concierge, uh, also roboto technician, and uh, uh, we have the additional reality as a term uh, to cite also the construction, the constructor, modernization of construction technologies. Also, in the sphere of transport, there will be an engineer for safety, uh, for transport grid, and uh, it is uh, a really very, very uh, just demanding uh, professions. And we have mind fitness coaches. Uh, and uh, in the sphere of uh, healthcare, we also have the uh, training procedures for a uh, genetic consultant and uh, the uh, technician for medical equipment. And social sphere tends to be also another focal point. And ro uh, roboto uh, te uh, techniques will affect the market to a large extent. Certain things may be done better by a robot than a human being, and also demographically the situation will change. Uh, but uh, we have some empathy uh, with the communication, uh, mobile uh, people care, uh, social communication. And so these professions will be very uh, promising. So the position of the social uh, worker with uh, uh, taking care of the people with limited physical abilities, also uh, the uh, protectors of, of um, consumer rights, and it is indispensable for the older generation. And uh, this is a list of those new professions in the social sector. But on the basis of the Department of uh, Social Protection, 
and labor. Uh, so we organized the interviewing. And in the short term, uh, there were tutors, uh, medical consultants, uh, modernization of construction technologies. As uh, to mid-term um, perspectives, these are PPP specialists, educational territories, IT um, uh, medical uh, workers, and uh, uh, constructors. And we anticipate that this is my last slide. Uh, th that we, as a social uh, department, uh, will have uh, in the future a vaster uh, dimension and domain uh, for. Uh, people to work in the sphere of communication uh, as uh, uh, robo uh, robotechnic uh, skills uh, might not be indispensable there. So human beings will be in demand. And uh, it is not just uh, the prospects for tomorrow. Uh, these are the prospects for today. Thank you for your kind attention. And indeed, uh, we have uh, several estimates uh, for labor market for less robotized uh, professions. And when people have to communicate uh, just man to man, like uh, nurses, like social uh, workers, like teachers, and uh, uh, robots uh may have their function in these fields, uh, but humans will be predominating. But in Moscow, it's hard to find a doctor who might uh, provide consult consultancy to a, a person uh, who completed the uh, genetic test. And I would like to pass the floor to our go uh, guest, Carlo Ratti from the Massachusetts Technical University. Carlo, the floor is yours. All right. Um, Good afternoon, everybody. Can I have the clicker? Yes, thank you. All right. Um, so I was actually to look at. I was asked to to look at something slightly different, which is more how design is changing, and so what type of uh, new professions are needed in uh, you know thinking about architectural design, urban design, urban planning, and so on. And so as uh, as we really mentioned today in many panels today, this morning, and so on, the city itself is. Uh, the, in the making of the city is becoming more complex. We are seeing, first of all, the digital physical convergence is what many people call smart or sensible cities. Um, we are seeing many other dimensions that make, you know, the, 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 that are changing the profession. So I put together just a few slides uh, related to this, starting, you know, with the old idea we had of knowledge. We used to think that knowledge was something like this. We could actually put everything in the same, in the right spot. And that goes back to, to the idea of, say, St. Thomas. When St. Thomas in the Middle Ages write his Summa, well, his Summa is supposed to be a full catalog of human knowledge at the time, everything in the right pigeonhole, everything in the right spot. And, you know, and uh, we now know that that's not the case anymore. We now know that if you had to build a map of knowledge, it probably looks a little bit more like this. That's the map that was on the cover of Nature magazine. You see how beautiful it is? It was made by taking 800,000 papers and looking at all the connections between them. If you got a scientific paper, you, you cite other papers, so you can easily create a map of the interconnections between every single new scientific paper which is produced. And if you look at this, you see how many new links are emerging. You know, links between the social sciences, computer science, brain research, mental health. You know, it's, uh, it's a map where everything is connected with everything else. It's a little bit like the map of the internet, you could say. You know, where, where you know, connections uh, combine and tie together all the different nodes. So, you know, if you think about this, it's probably closer to, to, to a map of today's knowledge, in this case, at least uh, about scientific knowledge. And uh, I believe that this is really quite fundamental. And again, this is from Nature. In Nature, look at what were the most important papers a few years ago, and what are the most impo important papers today. Now, bear in mind that for a scientific paper, you can very easily understand what is the most important paper by looking at how many people cite it. If you want, it's very similar to likes on Facebook. You know, how many people like your post or how many people cite your paper, the same principle. So you can look at the measure of impact 
and academics have developed many, you know, many ways to quantify this. For a publication, you talk about impact factor of a publication. Uh, for people, for scholars, you talk about age index. You count how many citations you have and how many papers. You combine that, and you got different age index uh, measures and so on. Now, going back to this, so you can quantify the impact of a paper. And Nature looked at the most impactful papers in the past and the most impactful papers today. Now, it turns out that in the past, a few decades ago, some of the most impactful papers were usually done by one author from a very well-defined discipline. And today, it's kind of the opposite. The most impactful papers today are actually usually many authors coming from many different disciplines. So this is what has been going on in science, and we believe that this is also happening now with city making. If you look at this, this is actually the image of Le Corbusier, one of the most celebrated architects of the 20th century, French Swiss. And in the 1920s, Le Corbusier presented his vision for Paris. And at the time, his vision for Paris was quite simple. It was basically demolish the whole city, just leave Notre Dame and a few other memories from the past, and replace everything with his new skyscrapers that you see here. And if you look at this, he, this picture is the, when he presented it. It was presented in, in October 1923 um, at a pavilion called the Pavillon de l'Esprit Nouveau. And uh, if you look at this, you know, the hand of Le Corbusier presenting the plan is the hand of the architect, but almost like the hand of God. Somebody who unilaterally, just one person, making decisions for millions of people without even bothering to ask them if they wanted to live in those skyscrapers, if they wanted to demolish all of Paris, you know, and just replace it with this. And that's a story a bit of architecture in the 20th century. We still have a lot of legacy about this here in Moscow or in many other cities around the world. Or think about cities built from scratch, such as uh, Chandigarh by Le Corbusier or Brasilia by Oscar Nimai and Lucio Costa. So that was the idea that you know, one person could make all these decisions for people. And we know now that that doesn't work. In a similar way to what we saw before with knowledge, actually the way we can actually tackle some of the big challenges, urban challenges we are discussing here at the forum, is really by coming together. It's through a network approach that brings us together in order to build on each other's strengths. But at the time, in the 20th century, people were saying this was the only way to build. There was even a saying in the US that went, you know, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. So if you put together a committee or a group of people, you don't end up with a horse, you end up with, uh, with a camel. By the way, I find the camel quite beautiful, but you know, but that's, uh, that's where the saying goes. And uh, we think that is changing. It's changing, so we really need to find new ways to, to bring different disciplines together in an unprecedented way when we tackle urban problems. And uh, we've been discussing this in, the, in one of the recent books we did called Open Source Architecture about can we actually learn from open source in software making and open source the making of uh, designing the city you know, and then allow for different people, different hands to come together and to shape the cities we live in. And I need to tell you a little story, you know, the way the, um, the, that book uh, originated was initially with an editorial I, read for Dom I, I did for Domus. Domus is a design magazine. Um, and uh, in this case, the, uh, they had a full issue on open source architecture. So they asked me if I would write the, the, the op-ed, the editorial for the issue. And I said, sure, I'm happy to do it. But if I'm going to do it, then I'm going to do it in a collaborative way. So what we did, we did a page on Wikipedia. I called for a few friends. You see them there, from Nicholas Negroponte to John Maida to Paolo Antonelli uh, to Hans Uri you know, to start writing together. And many, many other people added, were added to the page and started changing it until we ended up with, uh, with this text. Uh, it's interesting because at the beginning, actually, Wikipedia at the beginning kept on deleting the page, thinking that because it was a new page, it had no legitimacy. But actually, after we got it published in Domus, it became uh, a legit page. So now you can still see it as it originated, and as many, many more hands help on changing it later. Which is a bit the same addition process that we've been seeing in cities for thousands of years, about you know, starting with something and then keep on evol letting it evolve and, and, and having people engage in, in the transformation. And uh, so there was an issue here, actually, when I did the editorials that almost usually, however, they want to have a picture of whoever did the editorial. And I say, I'm not going to give you my picture. You know, this is some collaborative work. 
And so we've been fighting back and forth, and they didn't want to put uh, all of the pictures of the people involved. So in the, in the end, we found a trick, and we said, okay, okay, put, publish one picture, that's fine, but we gave them this picture. The picture combines, uh, combines all of us. And, uh, and so what I want to finish is this, is about thinking about the architect of tomorrow, or the planners of tomorrow. I hope, my wish, is they will look a bit, a bit less, like Le Corbusier, the guy who single-handedly will make decisions about the city of millions and millions of people without even bothering to ask them what they want, and a little bit more like a picture like this, a picture that combines all of us as we decide what type of future city we want. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I invite Sebastian Turbo, Executive Director, New Seas Foundation. Sebastian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yevgeny. No, I'm fine, don't worry. Um, it's just very quickly, the New Cities Foundation is a global nonprofit. We are a thought leadership and think tank organization, and we, we build communities and discussions around a set of issues that we consider critical to the future of cities. And indeed, this question of the future of work and how it links to cities is at the heart of our thinking. Because indeed, it links to questions around smart cities, around urban mobility, the fourth industrial revolution, the future of education. Many key questions link back to this question of cities and the future of work. As I was preparing this session, I kind of looked at the three main questions that were asked in the session description. The first question that was asked was, how dramatic are the changes in labor going to be? My short answer is, we don't really know. I mean, yes, you often see, in the, and I've seen it mentioned here before, the Oxford research saying that over 40% of jobs will soon be automated. There's a more recent report by the OECD that says that maybe it'll, it'll only be 9%. Yesterday, even PricewaterhouseCoopers released a, re a research in the UK saying that artificial intelligence might create as many jobs as are going to be displaced. So let's maybe agree that what, how, how dramatic this shift will be is not yet necessarily clear yet. The second question that was asked to us is, what kind of new professions will thrive in the cities of the future? My short answer here again is, we don't know. Yes, we believe, we anticipate that there's going to be skills that are going to be important, soft skills such as creativity, critical thinking, problem solving, people management, communication, etc. We also anticipate, as was mentioned earlier, that there are certain types of jobs are less likely to be automated. Jobs in you know, uh, creative industries or healthcare or social care, for example. But I would argue, like others, that we actually don't know what the jobs of tomorrow are going to be. Uh, another research says that in 15 years from now, 65% of graduates entering the job markets will be going into jobs that don't exist today. We don't know what the jobs of tomorrow are going to be. So we don't know what jobs are going to disappear. We don't know what the jobs of tomorrow are going to be. To be sorry. And this links me to the third question that was asked of us. How can we prepare the new generations to the new normal of these professional life? Given that we are a cities crowd, let me rephrase that to how can cities prepare the new generations to the new normal of their professional life, to a world of uncertainty, a world of the unknown? Well, first of all, I think it's fair to say, and I guess you'll all agree, that cities will be at the heart of this coming revolution. Maybe the bad news is that cities will be bearing the brunt of the dramatic changes that are going to occur. Indeed, cities, cities feel, feel sorry, these shifts more accurately as they serve as the places where these rapid movements are found, focused, and then filtered into society. As well, cities will increasingly compete against each other to train, attract, and retain the talents and the jobs of tomorrow. The more positive news is that while cities can do little, little to prevent the elimination of jobs due to automation, they can prepare their local economies for prospective high demand jobs that have low probabilities of being automated. They can equip workers with those promising skill sets that will be in demand in the future. And they can also be the first responders in ensuring an equitable social safety net for those most effective, affected. Sorry. So very quickly, uh, at New Cities, we've been looking over the past few months at 
what seems to be working best in cities and the strengths of cities that are labeled as least at risk of being vulnerable to automation. And here's very quickly what we found. These cities have strong connections to the education world and build strong pathways between education and local businesses. It might seem obvious, but there's still much efforts to be made. These cities invest in a diverse mix of occupation, meaning their economies are well diversified, so they should be less vulnerable should one industry change or de decelerate. These cities tend to leverage more federal, national, and regional funds and are careful to complement and to fill the gaps of what is not covered by these national or regional funds. These cities have strong city-led workforce development initiatives. They focus on living wages, soft skills training, adult literacy, coding, and last but not least, apprenticeships. This might seem obvious, but in critical high demand, high skills position, there are still too little apprenticeship schemes available. These cities also pay attention to what I refer to as the information gap. We're often talking about a skills gap, but I believe the information gap is as important. Often there are many services proposed by cities, but there is no big picture. Services are fragmented, confusing, duplicated, and difficult to navigate. Cities must develop integrated, coordinated support programs so that employers and job seekers can find the service they need when they need them. Finally, these cities, these cities consider that place matters. This was said brilliantly yesterday by Bruce Cass during the opening plenary, but I agree with him. Cities need to address the question of uncertainty by looking at place. Cities must create ecosystems of talent. They must think, think like a system and act like entrepreneurs to be able to be agile in the face of unknown and constant disruption. And placemaking indeed here is key. We must rethink and design our cities so that people can be learning and working anytime, anywhere. We need to move away from a vision of a city where this is where I live, this is where I work, and this is where I learn. We need many more mixed-use, flexible spaces so that workers, learners can constantly readapt to the changing world. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I fully agree with you uh, with another approach uh, for the urban uh, organization. And uh, there is a very typical uh, a problem in place in Moscow that we do not have a culture of the university campuses. And uh, uh, Moscow has to face a serious challenge. Uh, for creating a new infrastructure for the entire city, uh, city as a campus. And Moscow is one of the leaders uh, in the innovative cities. Uh, and uh, Moscow is placed third as to the quality of uh, skills uh, and competences for innovations. But as to the environment, uh, we are not placed in the top. And uh, uh, the whole city should be reconfigured so that it becomes becomes the venue uh, for the implementation of all sorts of changes and transformations. And I fully uh, agree with this I idea, and uh, which uh, has been formulated by the forum. Uh, Daryl West, uh, the director of Center for Technological Innovations, Brooklyn Institute. The floor is yours. OK, uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's been nice to learn a little bit more about Moscow. Uh, Moscow and what uh, digital technology is taking place and uh, what kinds of uh, innovations are uh, taking place. So I have a new book uh, that is directly related to the topic of our forum today. Uh, the book is entitled The Future of Work, uh, Robots, AI, and Automation. So I get into the accelerating pace of technology innovation in terms of new developments in uh, robots. Uh, they're getting more sophisticated and coming down in price. They're going to become more ubiquitous. 
artificial intelligence is really taking off. If you look around the world, uh, that's where the big technology money is being invested uh, these days. Autonomous vehicles, uh, which are basically AI systems, uh, not and no longer uh, cars, machine learning, uh, facial recognition. So all these technologies are, are really going to unfold much more rapidly than uh, many people uh, realize. So the question is, uh, what's it going to mean for uh, the workforce? And as Sebastian pointed out, there have been wide ranges uh, in terms of uh, the studies uh, that have uh, come out, uh, anywhere from uh, uh, the mid uh, single digits to 40, 50, and 60 percent uh, disruption in terms of the workforce. The study that I have found most uh, persuasive is a study by uh, McKinsey, which found that only 5 percent of occupations can be fully automated, but then 30 percent of the activities of 60 percent of the jobs can be automated. Now, if you think about that, that explains why there's so much variation. Because the real variation concerns the adoption levels of the new technologies. You know, how quickly are robots going to take over in industrial settings as well as in the consumer and home market? Uh, to what extent are autonomous uh, vehicles uh, going to uh, take over from human drivers? Uh, I spoke uh, yesterday at a panel and I uh, told people Uber has ordered 24,000 autonomous uh, vehicles with delivery starting next year, so they're going to be on the road, uh, at least in American uh, cities. And so part of the difficulty in projecting is we are, we're not just projecting possible job losses, but also what new jobs will be uh, created and then at what pace will these uh, new uh, technologies become uh, adopted uh, by consumers and by businesses. In terms of the jobs that will uh, disappear, the ones that are most likely to disappear most quickly are the entry-level jobs. So in the United States, uh, what we're worried about is we have 8 million people involved in the retail uh, sector. Many of those jobs are at risk of automation due to e-commerce. Uh, right now, about 10% of retail sales in America are do uh, or take place through e-commerce, uh, that number is going to triple uh, within a decade. Uh, so uh, soon there are going to be stores without any sales clerks. Uh, you will have uh, devices that will track the items you put in your shopping cart, automatically charge your credit card or mobile payment uh, system, and you'll walk out of that uh, store without interacting uh, with any humans. Uh, Amazon already has some uh, trial uh, stores of this sort. We have 2.5 million uh, truck drivers uh, in America, and this is a great occupation for entry-level people, uh, people, typically people who are graduating from high school, they don't want to go to college, and it's a good job uh, where people can uh, earn a living. Autonomous vehicles are going to uh, disrupt that sector uh, very significantly. Uh, the consumer market is going to lag, but uh, car riding services and truck driving uh, will uh, definitely be affected. And in America, again, we have one million taxi drivers and uh, ride-sharing people. So if you add all those entry-level jobs just from those three examples, that's 12 million uh, gateway uh, jobs. And that's really going to have a significant uh, impact on uh, the middle class uh, in America. There, of course, will be new jobs that are going to be required in the city of the future. Uh, certainly anything involving data sciences, uh, people will be golden because technology is all about the data. And we need people who have the uh, talent to analyze uh, data, present, and interpret uh, this information. Uh, E-commerce is going to be taking off, so there are certainly going to be uh, many new jobs created uh, there. And part of the growth of e-commerce uh, also requires the growth of delivery uh, services. So where Amazon is uh, growing most rapidly is actually on the warehouse side and the delivery side. Uh, the goal is to basically be able to deliver things uh, within uh, one or two days. Uh, in China, uh, they now have online services that are delivering within two to three hours. You can go around the city and you see all these guys on motorbikes and they're delivery people uh, from uh, e-commerce uh, sites. So that will certainly be a growth area. Uh, AI, particularly as it relates to images and facial recognition, is uh, definitely going to be a growth area. I talked with somebody who worked in a conservation uh, uh, company that was interested in tracking and preserving elephants uh, in Africa. 
And their firm ended up hiring 250 people in Uganda to train their AI image system because somebody had to basically feed 100,000 images into that AI system to basically train on what a normal elephant herd looks like, what a herd looks like when poachers start to attack, when farmers start to kill uh, elephants, and so on. And over the course of uh, developing those uh, systems, you need a lot of people to kind of tag images and say, this is normal, this is abnormal. Uh, so that will be a, a growth area. We are certainly going to create many new jobs through uh, emerging uh, technologies, but in the short run, the problem is going to be that some people, in fact, some people argue many people, may not have the skills uh, that are needed for those jobs. And so there could be a rather chaotic transition uh, period and the most important talent uh, during this transition period is going to be agility. Uh, Charles Darwin, the famous uh, student of evolution, had a famous quote where he said, survival goes not to the strongest or to the most intelligent, but the most adaptable. So the advice that I'd like to give uh, young people uh, worried about automation and, uh, and AI uh, is you have to engage in lifelong learning. Like the idea that we're only going to invest in education through about age 25, and then after that you're on your own, uh, that is no longer going to be relevant uh, as we move towards a digital economy. People are going to have to constantly upgrade uh, their skills. And the people who are going to do well will be those who are adaptable and agile. Thank you very much. Indeed. An excellent, let's say, start to give the floor to Ekaterina Cherchesova. Lifelong learning uh, is likely to become the main feature of the citizens of the future city. We must accept the reality, and the reality is that no skill, no piece of knowledge will provide a long, sustainable, sure position. But rather knowledge, but some other skills that will ensure us a safe future. The life in the condition of uncertainty will require other skills. Yekaterina is well known for creating a variety of successful educational projects. I would like you to describe how you see the future of the city and how the future of professions and trades. Thank you, Yevgeny. It's my pleasure to greet all participants of the day session. I really prepare to subscribe to what other speakers said or nearly to everything that they said. If you pass me the clicker, it will be very nice of you. Effectively, I decided that I will have a very brief presentation. We are running out of time. I would just like to uh, outline some ideas on which I will focus your attention today. Firstly, we should understand that at this point in time, we are we are living from the notion of some well-defined professions. When we say that there is a profession or a trade that you can master, that you can learn, and this profession will have a footprint on your life for a long time. No, the situation is no by no means like that. If you divide professions which are creative and conditional non-creative, humanity is moving towards creativity. While well, some time ago we could say that we had, let us say, bankers and people who maybe 10 or 15 years ago were described as office clerks, now everything that can be automated will be automated and the creative component of a human being, his creative potential should be unlocked to the full extent. Uh, here we are moving towards the situation where where more and more people will be dealing in those areas which I described as creative areas. And a free artist will not be a profession, but just a way of life.
survive for plenty of people. While in the past, we used to say that some professions were classified or categorized as a creative or art profession, nothing of the kind. If you talk about blockchain today, blockchain is a more than creative approach in the financial sector. And we come to the idea that automation and that practically everything that can be made automatic will be made automatic. And from this perspective, people face a new challenge. A person should, uh, let's say, realize that himself in a creative profession. And on the other hand, we are moving towards the situation when we talk about the teamwork. Uh, humanity will have to manage not only a human being, but also it will have to manage robots. On the one hand, we talk about decentralization of teams, or, or well, in some areas we communicate with a human being, and in some areas we communicate with a robot. And the global team and the centralized team is becoming more popular. On the other hand, we should talk more about the environment. All creative specialties are emerging inside of a particular environment. Any person dealing with the movie industry or design industry would like to go to the Hollywood. Any, per any person dealing with IT would like to land in the Silicon Valley because creative industry creates appropriate environment where you want to get into. And from this perspective, in my opinion, the cities have an objective to define their target audience and to create the environment which is needed for unlocking potential in creative areas. Any city and the image of any city is not only architecture, uh, it's not only urban environment, it's also the cultural environment and the human life environment. And if we focus on that, such factors will impact decision making on uh, what sort of city you select for living. And Kazan made a big step in this area. There are plenty of IT people. Uh, it's, uh, well, the office rent is much lower there. And uh, there, each third Russian company uh, develops its projects in Kazan. It's very important to identify your key advantages uh, well, and select your target audience and make uh, these people come to your city and live there. Because it's no important where you are, but what you are doing is really of importance. Uh, uh, in a nutshell, I would like to say what we are doing in our company. We have all main areas in the creative industries, design school, uh, IT graphics, the cinema school, etc., digital media, uh, Moscow music school, communication school, the food academy that we are going to launch soon, and very soon in September. Uh, deliberately in order to create a hub for entrepreneurship in the creative industry area, starting a business incubator to develop entrepreneurs' potential there. I would like to call your attention to the following. Really, for a long time, we'll be stepping aside from the notion of profession, which gives us bread and butter maybe for 20 years. We are moving to a totally different format of thinking to a different mindset. I often come across a situation where people expect from many educational establishment some correct navigation that people ask, uh, what are you going to teach me in your establishment? It's altogether wrong, in my opinion. You should take your education in your own hands. And the correct student asks, what I will know and understand once I graduate from your course course and from your masters, etc. Uh, we should take into account that we are going to learn for the duration of our life, and we are going to manage our educational trajectory, which follows your professional trajectory, career trajectory. Each two or three years, 
uh, will pass through that or other course in order to uh, be competitive. And we're not talking about profession one, profession two or three, but we're going to about a set of competences which make you a competitive player in the market. This makes uh, well, this makes a conscientious student different from non-conscientious student. While maybe 20 years ago could impact the decision maker of a student, now, now people uh, be, uh, start to know what they're going to do maybe once they become bachelors and 22 years old and they start to understand what is the profession of their dream. On the other hand, we understand that each five or six years a person will most likely change his or her profession and will be moving along his career path from one project to another project rather than from going to office every day and uh, receiving salary for that. When we talk about the project approach, uh, we see that f uh, from one project to another, a person needs new skills and new knowledge, and a person develops, grows from project to project. I would like to emphasize that uh, you should just relax and study throughout your life, getting uh, or adding those competences which you need. And we should be sort of futurologists, uh, you know, to, to predict professions as a, some narrow speciality, but rather the area of activity where you want to develop so that you can add those competences which you don't see it in the market. For example, quite clear that an architect who is familiar with the environmental agenda may be in bigger demand in a two or three years time because it's a growing issue. It cannot be a single area of activity. Uh, you cannot be in a silo or in a vacuum vis-a-vis -vis other areas. We're talking an, about absolute reciprocal integration. Everything which is written to with the materials, with the power sector, automatization, new forms of leadership where people who never were decision makers before, who were never entrepreneurs, suddenly understand that uh, that entrepreneurial approach is just a method to address that or other problem. And when uh, in a project, in a project, you address not only just the problem, but you also give good to the people and to the world at large. From this perspective, I think that we should be relaxed. We really do not know what is in store for us in five years or ten years' time. And in a good sense of the word, uh, well, we should follow the educational stream and learn throughout your life. That's my message to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really, uh, it's a very interesting aspect, ongoing change and the need to support uh, people during such changes, during such transitions. Speakers also mentioned that uh, changes will impact the most, let's say, popular professions in the city. Uh, the, one of the highest rates of robot, robotics is salesmen. Uh, well, thanks to robotics, the number of salespeople will reduce from 4.5 million to maybe 300,000 or 400,000 people. That's 10 times over. Uh, the dramatic change and the speed of this change uh, will have so, should have some supporting infrastructure. Uh, we have some time left before the end of the session. I suggest we move to the Q&A session. If uh, the the organizers will allocate some mics for questions from the floor. Meanwhile, I will ask my own question to the panelists, to any of you. We understand about education, but are there other ways to help people to adapt to change? Maybe uh, communities, maybe communications, networks, any other tool. In simpler words, how citizens of a large city will adapt to changes easily. 
Maybe you can give some uh, example or case. I mean, I can talk about the public policy piece because I think that's going to be especially important in every uh, country that's undergoing uh, automation. Uh, because, uh, and I think the, the comments that you made on uh, education and how it's going to uh, change things is very relevant. Because a lot of the work in the future is not going to be full time permanent jobs with benefits, it's going to be a series of part time jobs doing a, uh, going. Uh, project to project. So the challenge in many countries is going to be how to deliver benefits in that s situation and also how to provide sufficient incomes for people. It may not actually be the jobs question that is a problem. It's the benefits and the income question. In the United States, this is going to be a particular challenge because our social benefits are delivered through jobs. So if you have a job, you get health care, you get a retirement. Uh, if you don't have a job, no health care and uh, no uh, retirement. Uh, and so I think countries that are organized in that way are going to face a real uh, problem. So we're trying to think uh, in advance uh, what are the policy changes that are going to be needed in order to make benefits portable. People are likely to be moving uh, much more from job to job. I've been very fortunate in my adult life. I've had two jobs. I taught at a university. Now I work at a think tank. I tell young people, that's not going to be your experience. You're going to have six, seven, eight, or nine different jobs. You're going to be moving across companies and across sectors. So we need policies that help people during that transition period. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very interesting contribution. And it's particularly critical in view of the starting social reform in Russia. I am entrepreneur, vice president of the national technology policy. I am an expert of the industrial policy of the Russian uh, Union of Entrepreneurs. My question is, we say that really automation, robotics. What are talking about automation, uh, robotics, uh, and instead of 5 million, we're supposed to have 200. Uh, America will sort it out for sure. But the question arises, uh, uh, how is going to work now? Uh, so one farm is going to feed 100 people and one person is going to create a GDP per 1,000 and and we uh, by uh, our birth uh, will uh, be fighting uh, for our rights uh, to have a full-fledged uh, wage, but uh, we may be provided an opportunity to work for four hours, and that's it. Uh, so what are we supposed to do? Uh, sooner or later, the labor productivity uh, will allow us uh, to have uh, to sustain by a factor of birth and uh, the gold billion will be uh, working and uh, you guys may uh, be seated and we will be working for you. And this is some kind of a hawkish policy and this hawkish policy uh, will uh, force us uh, to fight uh, for every uh, sip of water and uh, for air breath. Who are supposed uh, to uh, speak about uh, the cross general income or uh, maybe some uh, do not believe in the efficiency of that system. Who is willing to answer? I'll, I'll answer quickly. On I mean, by the way, we, we were asked not to address uh, the question of a uh, global basic income. Um, that, that being said, it, it's not the first time in history that humanitary, humanity is facing a job revolution. You know, it's the famous example of the, of the Luddites in the UK, the whole question around the spinning wheel arriving and the effects this would have on, uh, on the job markets. Uh, so you can call me naive, you can call me too optimistic, um, but I have two little boys. I, I do not want to be telling them, look guys, sorry, you'll never have a job because there won't be any jobs left. I want to believe that we can create new good jobs in the future. Do I have the perfect solution? No, I wish I had, but I don't. But I want to, I want to set the bar high and to keep on fighting. That's my answer. Mm. Maybe I will, uh, I will add just something. Um, if you look at the great Louis Mumford uh, writing in the 1930s, you know, a great um, uh, scholar in the urbanism and so on, you know, in, a, in a book called Techniques and Civilization, what he says is, you know, we've seen this over and over again. And basically, we outsource to machines some of the stuff we don't like that much. 
And we can concentrate on other things. And as we concentrate on other things, we also create new jobs that we still cannot foresee today. So that has been the, the story over the past few hundred years, almost few thousand years, is technology little by little took over parts of what we used to do, and then we've been focusing on other things. Again, some of the professions today we are doing that are normal for us, you know, people 100 years ago could not even imagine. And I think, you know, if, uh, for, if this continues, this is overall good news. We get rid of some of the stuff we like less, provided we address the two issues that have been discussed, you know, about redistribution and the issue about transition. Uh, so provided we address that, it could be good. Now, in the longer term, the big thing is, you know, the, the question, the challenge here is what happens then at a certain point when we might get to the condition when machines are better than us at everything. So in the past, it was always the you know, machines are better than us for something, and we can focus on something else. And that's you know, the famous question of singularity. And uh, I think you know, there, you know, things are a bit more blurry, because we've never seen it, a condition when machines can take over basically everything. And um, I, think, you know, I think there's probably two uh, different directions. You know, one option, of course, is you know, the merging of uh, artificial natural evolution. So you know, that merging could be the solution, and then it's, become, it, it's about more like an alliance instead of a, a competition. Uh, but you know, I think still, still think it's, uh, it's going to take still quite a bit of time. Uh, that's you know, the question in the long term. And as Keynes said, you know, in the long term, we are all dead. Uh, thank you so much. Let me add, uh, as uh, the situation shows, any active robotization brings about the emergence of new jobs in some uh, related areas or those which are dedicated to the support of people uh, who are uh, sitting around this or that area uh, or sticking around. And the redistribution will be pretty smooth and flat and I do hope that uh, people uh, will live uh, not necessarily uh, in the regime of uncertainty. The number of jobs will be stable but the number of entrepreneurs will go up uh, and we will be in great need of these people. We have uh, time for one question. Uh, good afternoon uh, dear panelists. Uh, I represent the Department of Healthcare of Moscow. I like Ekaterina's presentation pretty much, uh, and uh, I'm a young specialist and a graduate. Uh, I would like to be a futurist uh, and uh, invest my money into the education. But there is a risk that you may not hit the nail or hit the target. And uh, the question arises whether we need some specific infrastructure uh, for those people who uh, will uh, just enhance their competences, uh, or what, uh, what will be the role of the government, of some private companies, and what should this model should look like, and what should be the infrastructure for that model. I uh, fully agree if you uh, have, uh, I fully agree with you, if you have a motivation, uh, you will um, hit the target. And indeed, uh, you put a question uh, to yourself. What else uh, I have to do and what else uh, needs to be done uh, by myself and by uh, other people around me uh, to uh, be developed? And at the year of uh, 15, 20, 25, 30, we may be retrained, uh, reoriented, and you may be developing in your sphere uh, on many occasions and might be various iterations. Uh, or you may just globally change your profession in 10 years' time. And that is essential in itself. And if you have your career trajectory for the coming uh, period, you do plan uh, for the coming five years to do something, to contribute into your education. And you'll definitely hit your target. And uh, uh, the question arises, who is going to take care of this trajectory? I'm uh, in favor of competition, and uh, education uh, should uh, be a competitive one and uh, you have to take the best uh, resources, uh, academic resources, uh, best teachers, and uh, better opportunities for students. And if an education uh, becomes students oriented or students centered, uh, that will be the great idea. It shouldn't be decided at the top level. 
and um, then it then these instructions goes to the the universities, then to the instructors, to professors, then it will go to the bottom to the students. No, we have to do it uh, otherwise. So you will have to proceed from the needs and demands of a student and of the industry and business. We really have to bridge this gap um, from one point of destination to another. And uh, if uh, we have this uh, approach from the bottom, uh, we will uh, structure a system of high-class projects which will be competing, and the students uh, will have to choose. This is an ideal approach. I am for the competition. I uh, Thank you, dear colleagues. I have to uh, wrap up. And today we had quite a number of uh, serious uh, concerns and apprehensions um, put forth. But uh, uh, nevertheless, we found some positive solutions as how to structure the uh, cities of the future and how we may get adapted to that reality. And the city which we're going to construct together will be comfortable. Uh, will be uh, easy to work at, and we will meet the challenges of the technological revolution. Thank you for your kind attention.